Well, share it at least. <laughs> now, the reading today is from Exodus, chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. Go. Assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. This is the word of the Lord. That's nice and enthusiastic. That's a good start. Morning. Okay, we're going to start with a quiz. Um, I'm going to give you uh, three adventurers. <coughs> Ranulph Fines, Bear Grylls, and El MacArthur. Okay, you got those names in your minds? Okay. I've got the names of three biographies. Okay, and you've got to attach one of the names to the biography. Is that okay? I just gave the names at nine o'clock and nobody had a clue. So I'm being a, being a bit kinder. Okay. So, Ranulph Fiennes, Bear Grylls, El, uh, Ellen MacArthur. Mud, Sweat and Tears. Bear Grylls. Well, you do know. Excellent. Full Circle. Ellen MacArthur. Mad, Bad and Dangerous to Know. Ranulph Fiennes. See, that was easy, wasn't it? But none of these biographies of great adventurers hold a torch to Moses. He is an Old Testament rock star. He gets a two-volume biography, Exodus and Numbers. He was born a Hebrew in Egypt. 
Pharaoh was so worried about the proliferation of the Hebrews that he ordered the Hebrew babies to be slaughtered. There was so much of a perceived threat by their fruitfulness and multiplication. Can you hear anything from the Genesis story there? Just as God had ordained, go forth and be fruitful. Joseph, son of Jacob, grandson of Isaac, great-grandson of Abraham, had arrived in Egypt 400 years before. The brothers had settled there. The father had settled there. They had died there. They were the patriarchal line, children of the promise. And yet here were their ancestors, slaves, in significant number, and yet despised and feared, and infanticide ensued. Yet Moses was rescued. A basket floating on the river led him to the queen. Moses therefore became an Egyptian prince, a Hebrew by birth, an Egyptian by adoption. He was at the top of the government, just like Joseph seven or more generations before. And he could see the injustice when faced with the reality of the cruelty that Egyptians showed Hebrews He lost his cool and took the law into his own hands and killed an oppressive Egyptian against a Hebrew slave. Knowing that his crime was discovered, he flees and ends up in Midian on the other side of the wilderness from Egypt. There he's adopted by a family, he meets his wife Zipporah and he spends a peaceful life tending the flocks of his father-in-law Jethro. Now, thus far in the biblical story, uh, the movie The Prince of Egypt by DreamWorks, which I confess I only watched at the weekend, it's very good, by the way, asks several interesting questions which are not directly addressed in the biblical narrative. How did Moses feel when he discovered he was actually a Hebrew? He'd been brought up an Egyptian. How was his relationship with the royal household of Egypt? How did he feel after he left Egypt? What was his state of mind immediately before his call from God on the mountain at the burning bush? Now that movie begins with a disclaimer which says, this is an interpretation, It's it's not actually the biblical narrative. I can just hear the complaints and objections that must have come to the filmmakers to have needed to put that up. That's not in the Bible. It's not meant to be. I think it's interesting and legitimate questions for us to ask. Now, the next steps are well known. A challenge to the Pharaoh, let my people go. Nine refusals, nine plagues. Then a final plague. There is a reflection of Pharaoh's own incision to the Hebrews. Death for the Hebrew boys becomes death to the firstborn. The Hebrews are saved by blood from the ceremonial lamb daubed on the doorposts. The destroyer comes and God's terrible vengeance is exacted. Pharaoh relents and they leave. Nearly out of the country of Egypt, the Egyptians chase anyway and by a miracle the seas part and the Israelites escape and the Egyptians are drowned. Psalm 136 recounts all of these events. They would be told by Hebrew families and communities for many years to come all the way to the modern day. These are momentous events. In the wilderness, it's a mixed bag. Lots of grumbling. God's provision of meat, food and water despite the ungratefulness of the people. The Lord provides the law, rules to help people to be righteous and holy. And the design of a tabernacle that would reflect what had been lost, the garden in which man had experienced God's very presence. It's a tent, a place of special presence. And within it, an ark in which the law can be found. The laws are precise. The laws are clear. I will restore what you have broken. Follow me, says the Lord. Moses is the leader called to lead the chosen people in this task. 
But the first volume, Exodus, ends with Moses unable to enter the meeting place. For the glory of the Lord was there, even though he had entered the Lord's presence up in the mountain, in this place given to them by God, he cannot enter. Volume 2, Numbers, starts with a census. Lots of numbers, hence the name. There are many rebellions against Moses. There are neighboring kings who want to get the prophets to prophesy against Israelites, um, even though they, the Hebrews, don't know anything about it. The Balaam and Balak story happens in a mountain when they're down in the valley. Balaam came through where Balak wanted cursing. He, hearing from God, could only bless them. This rebellious generation in the valley, however, must die before the next are ready to enter the promised land. They get so close and yet so far. Moses disobeyed once too often with the rock, depending on his own wisdom rather than God's instruction. We find that he will not enter the land. That becomes Joshua's job. Yet Moses spends a whole book reminding, teaching, and training the Israelites how to honor the gift God has given them. We call this book Deuteronomy. Moses dies at the end. His error in the wilderness with the rock and the water, his lack of trust, his disobedience meant that while honored by God, he was not to enter the promised land. In anyone's book, this is a great story of a great man, an adventurer, as I said, an Old Testament rock star. For centuries, uh, this man would have fitted the bill, because at this point, while I was writing this sermon, I had some music playing in the background, and just a certain song came on at this very point, and the words seemed appropriate. Did you ever know that you're my hero, and everything I would like to be? I can fly higher than an eagle, for you are the wind beneath my wings. I never listen to country, by the way. I just happened to put it on at this time. The law of Moses became the watchword for the first century Hebrews. Yet they seem to have misunderstood their hero. They seem to have twisted the ideal. Jesus would challenge the religious leaders of the time, accusing them of making excuses for rebellion and making laws that were not of God, but mostly of not recognizing God's very presence right in front of them, Jesus himself. Yet even then, Moses makes a final biblical appearance but not center stage like in Exodus and Numbers, but at Jesus' side. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor. Talking with Jesus, they spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring fulfillment at Jerusalem. Luke 9, of course, this is the transfiguration on the mountain. In that discussion, of course, they are referring to Jesus' trial, death on the cross, resurrection and ascension, ready to return and restore all things. Great as Moses was, hero to many, he was only a precursor to the ultimate hero. Yet we see him honored here on the mountain as God is showing the disciples who would pass on to us the glory that is God's chosen to work out his plans for us. Moses was a great man who did great things for the Lord. But you may have noticed I haven't yet mentioned today's reading. What is God doing? He is calling Moses. He has lived, Moses has lived a life as a pagan, as an Egyptian. He is born into the people of God, but is nurtured as an Egyptian. Frankly, he doesn't know what he is. He has been miraculously saved from infanticide in such a way that he becomes royalty. He is so incensed by injustice that he becomes a murderer of one of his own, an Egyptian, in defense of one of his own, a Hebrew. He is a fugitive. He has found peace. It's maybe 40 years after he fled Egypt. The stories of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, are to him centuries old, 
Think 1600 as being our equivalent. Yet God can introduce himself as the God of these three monumental Old Testament characters, and it means something to the people. All of these patriarchs were flawed and broken, cheats, liars, cowards, who would, could show spectacular lack of wisdom. Yet they obeyed in their own way and loved a new God. Moses, faced with a miraculous bush, burning bright but not burning up, and reminded about the holiness of the ground that surrounded it, is spoken to directly, despite who he is and what he has done. He is commissioned, and he tries his best to wriggle out of it. Why me? Who should I say sent me? I can't speak well. Why would they listen to me? God has an answer for every objection. Why me? Because I chose you. Who should I say sent me? I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I can't speak well. Well, I'll send your brother to go with you. Why would they listen? Here, take this staff. You will do miracles with it. God has an attitude about being God, and he won't let go of someone he has called. So what can we learn from the story of Moses? There's a line in the Prince of Egypt movie in a song near the end. Look at your life through heaven's eyes. Moses had every reason not to believe he could do anything for God. He wasn't a proper Hebrew. In fact, he was part of the government that oppressed them and killed their young. He wasn't a proper Egyptian since he knew in his heart he was a Hebrew so confusing. He was a murderer. He was a fugitive. Yet God called him, used him, and yet he would not harvest the fruit of a lifetime of service, being barred not only from the tabernacle, but also from the promised land. Moses was an Old Testament rock star. Flawed, brilliant, adored and rejected, wise and impulsive, close to God and yet punished and eternally honoured, which is why he appears on the mountain of transfiguration with Jesus. Moses is potentially you and me. The question for us today is this. What does your life look like through heaven's eyes? What flaws can God discount to allow him to use you? What confusion in your life can mean that you are perfectly positioned to honour and glorify him? How can you obey, get closer to God, and be more intimate with him? At the end of Prince of Egypt, Miriam, Moses' sister, looks back at the 600,000 Israelites who have crossed the sea and escaped from Egypt and says to Moses, look at your people, they are free. How much do you want to say that about the people of Purley or wherever you're based? Look, they are free. (coughs) And John 8 says this, Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free... You are free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants. Take off your sandals, God said to Moses, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. We are all Abraham's descendants. God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses knew that. He has passed into history and passed on what God gave him, how to be holy, how to obey God's plan, how to bring a people to freedom in God's economy. Are we willing to take up that baton? Let's pray.
Father, we thank you for Moses. We thank you for the story that we have just heard with all its ups and downs. And we thank you for your part in that story, never letting go, always having a plan, always being faithful. And when we look at things, we look at them with human eyes. But you look at our lives through heaven's eyes. Show us that different way. Gives a heart for freedom for all peoples that comes through the death of your son, the resurrection, and his coming again. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.